Hello folks, I do apologise for being late once again. Late seems to be the new normal at the moment for me, which is quite ironic because I used to be super on time all the time. I used to get really anxious if I was ever late for anything. So uh, yeah, we had some technical issues last night. Uh, apologies for the delay in that one. And the same's happened again this evening. I don't know where Jackie is. <laughs> so she is due to be here giving us a uh, the third part of three of the talk of um, the inner child on love addicts and love avoiders. I wonder which one you might be. Are you a love addict? I've got that Robert Palmer song in my head, Addicted to Love from the 80s. Do you remember that one with the ladies all dressed in black playing guitars? So that's my earworm today. Uh, as you can see, I'm just playing for time here because I don't know where Jackie is. <laughs> so yes, love addicts and love avoiders. I wonder if you are, if you identify with one of those, or perhaps one of your partners, current, past, present, uh, may be a love addict or a love avoider. So I'm hoping that Jackie's going to make it to tell us all about it. She did message me about 15 minutes ago to say, can you send me the link to the studio? And I did so. And then uh, it's all gone quiet. So I'm guessing something has happened, uh, which uh, is, is what happens, isn't it? Live broadcasts and all that. So I'll just talk for a bit and uh, hopefully Jackie will be along. And if she isn't along in five or 10 minutes, then we'll just knock it on the head and try again another night. So I'll let you know what's coming up. First of all, tomorrow, 10.30 in the morning, Jaffa and Steve will be here for part three, episode three of Tools for Living Your Life, which has been really well received so far. Uh, nice energy they've got bouncing off each other there and offering some NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, tools to help you with relationships and achieving goals and all sorts of other useful stuff like that. So that's 10.30 tomorrow, streaming live on The Hive. Saturday is Book Club with Rachel. So if you're in that already, I'm guessing you're coming to the end of The Road Less Travelled Now, one of my favourite books of all time. And they're going to be changing books soon and letting in new members. So you can join in the fun and frolics and very connecting stuff, I believe, goes on there. Uh, so they'll be reopening that pretty shortly to people who want to try their next book, which is also very wonderful. And I won't tell you what it is. I'll let Rachel do that. Sunday is uh, another new session. We had a session, new session with Karen last night talking about uh, what was it called again? The Search for Meaning, which I thought was lovely, very authentic and um, useful uh, to hear someone's personal perspective, very eloquent, and um, a lot of people resonated with those messages, I think. Oh, just got a message. Who's this from? Oh, it's from, oh, yes. Okay. Oh, here we are. Jackie is here. Wonderful. Uh, and what else? Sunday. Yes. So new session, Singer Size on Sunday. That's 7 p.m. So do join us for that. And I will just see if Jackie is well, uh, ready to join us. Oh, well, no I problem. forgot to press enter ah, no studio. Problem. No problem, you're here now. Are, are you okay? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. And it's Good. nice to see you. And hello, everybody. Right, um, nice. I'm going to get cracking because uh, there's a lot to cover here. So briefly, uh, you know, I did my training five years five years ago, oh God, 20 years ago uh, at the Centre for Counselling and Psychotherapy Education in London. And um, Paul's father, Keith, was uh, was in my year the whole five years all the way through. And uh, I was chuffed to bits when Paul announced three years ago that he was going to do the same training. So well done, Paul. Yeah, it's brilliant. And I'm biased. I think it's the best training there is actually. But um, I'm biased, I guess. So um, what I'm going to do is a quick run through of codependent stuff. Just a little a little teaser for people who haven't listened to the other the other talks. And so I'm going to get cracking because I've got um, a conveyor belt of books on my table here to go through. And I will be quoting a lot from Face and Codependence. Um, you know, I bought this book 15 years ago and I just skimmed through it. So I've learned a lot researching for this to do this talk. And uh, I wish I'd read it when I was married, actually. But 
that's that's the way it is. So I'm just going to start with a few quotes. And the first one is from Healing the Shame That Binds You by John Bradshaw. Uh, and it's on loving yourself. And uh, he says, toxic shame's greatest enemy is the statement, I love myself. To say I love myself can become your most powerful tool in healing the shame that binds you to truly love yourself will transform your life. And then he he mentions a, squo a, a quote from Scott Peck. Uh, so this is how Scott Peck has defined love. Uh, As the will to extend myself for the sake of nurturing my own and another's spiritual growth, this definition sees love as an act of the will this means that love is a decision. I can choose to love myself no matter what the past has been and no matter how I feel about myself. That one out the way. And then, um, oh, I'd just like to say that um, recently um, an old trauma reared its head for me and uh, I had the privilege of working with Joe Bartholomew, he, who is an EMDR uh, therapist. And we did some wonderful work and I can't recommend her highly enough. So anyone who has an issue with trauma or what, whether it's one or, or several, uh, I would highly recommend, uh, recommend her. And uh, she is, as you know, a member of the Hive. Yeah, she indeed so, did a talk, didn't she, a few weeks ago yes, about she did. trauma and EMDR. Yes, so, she did. Yeah, if you haven't seen that, folks, have a look on the recordings topic. So let's get on um, now. Mm. This is this is a quote from again John Bradshaw in a book he wrote called Creating Love, and I, it's just very short. I will read you this. Um, Where am I? Oh, yes. So um, it's a quote from R.D. Lang. Uh, what we think is less than what we know. What we know is less than what we love. What we love is so much less than what there is. And to that precise extent, we are much less than what we are. And another quote from somebody called Richard W. Firestone, most people choose an emotionally deadened, self-limiting mode of life. They have ceased to want what they say they want because real gratification and accomplishments threaten the process of self-nourishment through fantasy. Let's get rid of that. Right, so... What I'll do is uh, I'm going to be quoting a lot from Facing Love Addiction, but what I'll do, I'll do it in two parts. I'll do the first part, which is on the love addict, uh, and then we'll have a little break. So if anybody has any questions, we can take those then, and then we'll go on to look at the love avoider. Otherwise, it's going to be a lot of talking, and I don't want anybody to lose the will to live. So... Uh, <laughs> Right, so let's get right. Um, so if you want to witness toxic love in addiction in action, watch the dinner party scene in Dr. Foster, the series Dr. Foster. Um, so I'm just going to do a little bit of catch up, some quotes from eminent leaders in their field of, co of uh, codependence. Um, and... I'm just going to go through this quickly. This is Pia Melody, the first one. A disease wherein a person has difficulty, one, experiencing appropriate levels of self-esteem, two, setting functional boundaries, three, owning and expressing their own reality, four, taking care of their adult needs and wants, five, experiencing and expressing their reality moderately. And then here's another one from somebody I never heard of called Kitchens. Uh, a maladaptive bonding within a family system to survive psychologically and socially in this dysfunctional family 
the child adopts patterns of thinking, acting and feeling that at first dull the pain, but finally are self-negating in themselves. These patterns become internalized and form an essential part of the personality and the worldview of the individual. The child continues to practice these self-destructive patterns of thinking, behaving and feeling in adulthood, and in so doing, recreates over and over again the bonding in which the destructive patterns originate. And I'm going to give an example of, of how that family dysfunctional family um, roles work in, in, the, um, in the family dynamic. I'm going to give a description of something that happened to somebody later on. Mm -hmm. um, and then this one is from Harvill Hendricks, who wrote a, a, couples, a couples therapist who is very famous, who wrote Getting the Love You Want. And I'll, I'll be talking about him towards the end and give a brief quote. Uh, a, partic a particular form of unconscious loving, an agreement between people to stay locked in unconscious patterns, an unconscious conspiracy between two or more people to feel bad and limit each other's potential, the freedom wherein the freedom of each is limited. And another one from Lash, somebody called Lash, who I haven't heard of either. Um, an often fatal disease of emotional confusion marked by severe, severe alienation from one's own feelings, living for and through others due to the inadequate developmental, the development of self-love as a true basis for loving others variously defined as one, uh, the addiction to living for others at the expense of one's own development, two, the substitution of adaptation for honest self-expression, three, the vicious cycle of using and blaming that arises when we make others responsible for what we feel and do, uh, and for the mechan mechanism of c control, controlling that locks people into futile dependencies and impossible demands. Five, abuse and discounting disguised in the attitudes and gestures of love, loyalty, devotion, caretaking, people pleasing. Uh, any combination of the above. And the last one is from somebody called Small, a spiritual condition, the shadow side of our love nature, a dis-ease of unequal relationships being acted out, of giving our power away. Mm. I'm going to try and summarize all of those now in about three sentences. Okay, go on. Good luck, me. Uh, so it sounds like it's something that's usually has its roots in childhood, as most of these things do. Uh, so a maladapt maladaptive defence against difficult conditions around parenting, family dynamics, all that type of stuff. And then we take it into adulthood, and quite often you'll find codependent people together and with this kind of unconscious behaviours and they're both yeah. kind of feeding off each other with this unspoken agreement of... Yeah you're going to meet my needs, I won't be happy unless you're happy, all of that yeah, type of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, right, so, uh, facing, oh, I'm just going to read a little bit about, because we will be talking in August, at the end of August, about negative control through, from our caregivers. So I'm just going to read, um, this is it. This is from Facing Love Addiction, but I'm just going to read a little bit about negative control. Uh, this is for anyone who has had experience with a very controlling parent or parents. Codependent, oh God, I can't see that. Codependents either, one, try to control others by telling them who they ought to be so the codependents can be comfortable, or two, allow others to control the codependents by dictating who they should be to keep others comfortable, 
Either form of negative control sets up negative responses in the person being controlled, and these negative responses cause the codependents to blame others for their own inability to be internally comfortable with themselves. Uh, right, that seems to be that then. Okay. Um, but there was something on resentment, hang on, that, that was that was interesting. Now, where the devil has that gone? Um, well, anyway. Anyway, we'll go on. We'll go on. So this this is the characteristics of the love addict. Right. Okay. Three characteristics sum up the major behavioral systems of a love addict. Love addicts assign a disproportionate amount of time, attention, and value above themselves to the person to whom they are addicted. And this forces this focus often has an, an obsessive quality about it. Love addicts have unrealistic expectations for unconditional positive regard from the other person in the relationship. Love addicts neglect to care for or value themselves while they're in the relationship. Um, and then she goes on to talk about two fears, one conscious, the other unconscious. Love addicts are often in the grips of two principal fears. The most conscious fear is the fear of being left. This denied fear also comes from the childhood experience of either physical or emotional abandonment or both. Love addicts did not experience enough intimacy from their abandoning caregivers to know how to, to be an intimate in a healthy way. So in adulthood, love, why love addicts often think they are intimate and are seeking an intimate relationship, they are in fact frightened by others of healthy intimacy because they don't know what to do. When they reach a certain level of closeness, they often panic and do something to create distance between themselves and their partners again. And these two fears of abandonment and intimacy bring up the agonizing and self-defeating dilemma of the love addict. Love addicts consciously want intimacy, but can't tolerate healthy closeness, so they must unconditionally choose a partner who cannot be intimate in a healthy way. Mm, this um, sounds like the, the kind of schizoid defense that Freud yeah. talks about. It's that double bind of they, they really want friends, they want intimacy, they want closeness, but they're also incredibly frightened of that kind of commitment. It's a toxic dance. Mm. And I remember uh, the late, bless him, David Newens, who was my supervisor for many years at the CCP. He once drew me a diagram of a circle and he had two stick people and he put one stick person in the circle and then he put the other stick person in the circle. And the minute the other stick person entered the circle, the first stick person jumped out. And I thought that was a really good way of showing it. So, um, so this is what she says about childhood abuse experiences of the love addict. Uh, I have come to believe that people fall into love addiction because of the unhealed pain from childhood abandonment and the feeling that they cannot be safe in the world without having somebody else that can hold them up. They cling to a delusional belief that the other party has the power to take care of them, affirm them, and somehow make them complete. They keep trying to get the love avoidant to match their unrealistic, hang on, to match their unrealistic mental image. And this insistence creates a great deal of the toxicity between the two of them. Uh, as children, love addicts experienced enormous fear because they were helpless to create connection with their caregivers. In counseling, they often describe that child fear 
as a sense of having a loss of their own breath, as if their air supply has been cut off and they were literally dying. They also described being empty because they weren't filled with nurture by their caregivers. And because they weren't nurtured for who they were, they had trouble being or liking their natural selves. In addition, many were angry because their needs went unmet since there, there are fleeting moments when such children are conscious of the abuse they are experiencing. This severe degree of separation in childhood, the original neglect or abandonment experience has an extremely toxic effect on children that extends into adulthood. The original abandonment experience is particularly filled with pain, fear, anger, shame, and emptiness. Because the children have no place to express these emotions, they store them up inside and fire them off years later. When the threat or actual experience of being left in adulthood stimulates the accumulated emotions. Um, even as children, love addicts long to get connected, to belong to someone, to finally feel safe by bonding with people who they think will fill their gaping emptiness and banish their feelings of inadequacy. They seek the person who will relieve the stress of the original abandonment experience, as adults almost any other person will do. A lover, a parent, a friend, their own children, a counselor, a minister. If the other party isn't powerful, it doesn't matter. The love addict will invest this person with enough imaginary power and unconditional love to make the love addict whole and deliriously happy. Uh, and then she goes on to talk about um, the fantasy of a rescuer being born. Uh, one way such children may escape the pain of severe abandonment by the parents is to fantasize about being rescued by a hero of some kind. Little girls may imagine a knight in shining armor who has loving feelings for her and who does things that demonstrate this love uh, by connecting with her, finally giving her life meaning and vitality. The fantasy is often very much like the fairy tale Sleeping Beauty, in which Sleeping Beauty lies asleep and out of touch with herself and her surroundings until the life-giving kiss of Prince Charming awakens her. Children spend so much time in this fantasy world because it creates a state of euphoria. For male love addicts, the rescuer is often some version of the super nurturing female. For gay men and lesbians, it is often another same sex person. This fantasy becomes more and more ingrained in the subconscious mind as the person grows older. As adults, these people continue the search for someone to fulfill their rescuer fantasy. Uh, Right, now, let's look at something else. 38. So I'm yes. just going to jump in and say that it sounds like what was missing in childhood, whether they, they weren't nurtured, they weren't shown love, they didn't have that unconditional acceptance from their parents, there's a hole there. And then to try and fill that hole, they escape into fantasy, uh, fairy tale kind of rescuing and then in adulthood it can be that the, the love addict will then invest all of their happiness and self-esteem in this almost pedestalized figure absolutely and, and they, their self-esteem is is totally dependent on this other person yeah they're just waiting for the super man or super woman to come along and sweep them off their feet and and take care of everything mm. really rescue them nurture them do everything that was missing for them that they didn't feel they had when they were children. Mm -hmm. uh, so she says, love addicts 
are attracted to people with certain identifiable and fairly predictable characteristics. And people with these characteristics are attracted to love addicts in return. The primary attribute marking of all the characteristics of the model partner for a love addict is avoidance, which seems incredible to the to their partners since love avoidance come onto their partners as so strongly at first. That's the attraction. This person seems to be the knight coming in on his charger and he's going to fix everything and he's going to be so capable. But then <laughs> he, he, he dodges in and out of the relationship. Um, so um, characteristics of the love avoidant Love avoidance have at least three characteristics that combine to result in avoiding intimacy. Love avoidance evade int intensity within the relationship by creating intensity in activities, usually addictions, outside the relationship. Love avoidance avoid being known in the relationship in order to protect themselves from engulfment and controlled by the other person. So they may feel really suffocated by the needs and the constant pressure from the love addict. Love avoidance avoid intimate contact with their partners using a variety of processes I call distancing techniques. So, um, so, Love avoidance consciously and greatly fear intimacy because they believe that they will be drained, engulfed, and controlled by it. As we shall see in childhood love avoidance, as we shall see in childhood love avoidance were drained, engulfed, and controlled by somebody else's neediness, somebody else's reality, um, and somebody else's existence and they don't want to go through that experience again. Um, this experience of childhood enmeshment created, created a deeply ingrained conviction that more intimacy will bring more misery based on experience both with the original caregivers and with other love addict partners. Um, So basically, she's saying that evading intensity within the relationship, a major goal for love avoidance is to keep intensity within the relationship to a minimum. Because relationship intensity feels very draining, is frightening, and threatens to be overwhelming. They avoid intimacy by focusing on something outside the relationship, as we've just said in an addictive way. Any addiction will do, and the effect is the same. They are not available to the partner for an intimate relationship. By focusing on something outside the relationship, love avoidance create too much distance from the love addict. Their partners get the feeling that love avoidance are not really in the relationship because in a very real way, they're not. Uh, in addition, the intensity of focus outside the relationship gives love avoidance a sense of energy, uh, of being involved in life. Uh, they don't feel such energy within the relationship because they keep it at a low intensity. A love addict's awareness of this absence of energy furthers a sense of too much distance from his or her partner. So, um, I hope people, if they have questions, they're writing down. Um, right, so let's see. Maybe we should pause there. Mm, I was thinking that the, the love avoider. Anybody, in case anybody has some questions. Yeah, do you type them in, folks, if you have any questions. Meryl's here and she says, hello, Jacqueline, great topic. Hi, Meryl. And Karen is with us as well. And she, I think she's referring to uh, Dr. Foster, great scene, the dinner yeah. table. Yeah, yeah. Um, and lovely quotes as well, yes. Um, so, yeah, um, love avoiders, it seems that there's there's a commonality between the addicts and the avoiders because fear is at the root of their behavior. 
So uh, the, the love addicts fear being abandoned and the love avoiders fear the commitment. Well, they feel they, they're, they're getting smothered, basically. They can't mm. take the intensity. It's too smothering. So mm. they, have to, they have to find a way to, uh, you know, sort of escape from time to time. So they either get wrapped up in work, uh, become workaholics or uh, going to the gym or going out with friends. Uh, there's always something that they need to do that's more important than staying at home. Mm. Uh, and also, uh, you know, um, I think a lot of people, what they do also is they're just not comfortable being with their partner alone. So you will find very often that love avoidance always creates situations where they have lots of friends around. They're just not comfortable doing one-to-one -one in a mm -hmm. relationship. Mm -hmm. They need to have a lot of people, a lot going on, a lot of excitement, a lot of energy is going into the various activities that they get involved with. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, a lot of them, I suppose, get to the point where they feel so suffocated in the relationship that the minute they get out and get with their friends, even if their partner is with them, the partner somehow gets forgotten, gets left. So, you know, it isn't just that in a one-to-one -one relationship that things get a bit tricky. Uh, it's even when there's they're in company with lots of other people, the love addict can still feel completely isolated and, and abandoned. Um, because there's no attention being paid to them. All the attention is going to everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, uh, they can't communicate, of course. They don't know how to communicate. So they are unable to sit down and say, well, can, can we just look at what's going on here? Last night when we went to so-and-so, uh, you know, I sat on my own all night and, okay, I chatted to a few people but you were you were all over the place and you never you never spent a minute with me why is that you know but people don't mm. people don't talk uh and and uh, you know then they harbor resentments they get angry uh, they and frustrated and then they you know all kinds of toxic behavior ensues from that that frustration of feeling completely abandoned Mm. So would you say that love addicts and love avoiders quite often find themselves together in relationship? Or oh, absolutely. That, yeah, yeah. It's, that's the dance. That's mm. the dance. You know, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I suppose, you know, the, the individual, the, the real core issue here is everybody wants to feel loved. Everyone, everyone wants to feel they belong. Everyone wants to feel that you know, to have that feeling of, of, of uh, not, you know, nobody's joined at the hip, for goodness sakes. It's not, although some obsessive people, believe me, they are almost joined at the hip. So they do everything together. And, uh, and, and that's a real codependent trait as well, of not being able to spend any quality time without their partner. Uh, and it's wonderful that in a partnership that people love doing things together, that, that, that's a wonderful thing. But uh, when it gets a bit distorted, you see people who um, don't feel comfortable unless the partner is with them. So it's not like a woman goes off and has lunches with her friends or goes to do something at a friend's house and, and then she meets up later with a partner. It's that uh, she wants to be doing everything mm. that the partner is doing yeah. and vice versa. So very much an all or nothing, whereas the healthy place to be is, as in all things in life, having that balance of healthy relationship together, growing together, allowing each other space and interests and having their own separate space and interests. Absolutely, because that's a healthy way of being. You know, uh, who wants to be completely glued to somebody 24-7? Uh, it's... it's it's rather overwhelming if you think about it. You never have any space for yourself. Don't you have a right to have some space for yourself? 
you know, it's like uh, if you have an animal and the animal, you know, follows you around everywhere. And so you think, I'll just go and escape for a minute and I'll, you know, go and read or something. The next thing you know, there he is and he's sitting and he's all over you. And, you know, it's a bit like that. Never mm -hmm. have feeling that you have a minute to yourself. Everyone mm -hmm. needs some time for themselves. And unfortunately, a lot of people aren't able to negotiate that. Yeah. It's either it's all or nothing. That... Sorry, Jackie, I missed that. It's either all or nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm guessing that lack of awareness is a big issue here. So people who are love addicts or love avoiders or in, or in relationship with one won't see it as terribly unusual what's going on. No. And they won't be no. able to own their part in it either. No. I mean... I. You know, I, I say that quite humbly. I wish I'd read this book when I was married. I really do. Because, uh, you know, uh, this is, people don't know. People just, they want to fix something and they, they, they know that deep down, they know there's something not right and they're not happy. And, and this is how, of course, with couples, this is how arguments start, you know, because one gets accused of doing too much with his friends or whatever. And, and uh, it's usually the men, but there are women who are love avoidance as well. But, um, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of makes you realize that some people find it difficult to breathe. They haven't got space to breathe. Uh, but of course, it's where they come from, you know, because if, if somebody was totally functioning and totally aware, they would see these difficulties happening in their relationship and they would sit down with their partner and say, you, you know, what happened yesterday? You know, I just went off to the barbecue with my, my friends and, and you absolutely went berserk because I wasn't there for a couple of hours. So, you know, and if you can't talk about it, then the thing just keeps spiraling and spiraling and spiraling until eventually uh, there's a split up, there's a breakup because it becomes intolerable. Mm. Or you have another way. You have the, the, the kind of man that goes along, if the woman is quite controlling, that goes along with everything she wants and doesn't say anything. And absolutely uh, looks like he's very happy with everything that's going on. And, uh, but I wonder if he had, if he really could find a choice for himself, whether he would actually, um, break out and do some things for, for himself. And there are a lot of men married to really controlling, and I'm not saying these women aren't loving women, but quite controlling women who, you see it, you know, they don't have many friends of their own. They don't go out with the boys. They're always going and doing what their partner wants to do. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not healthy mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, to, to, to not have that time to breathe, not have that space, not have your time, your time to sit and do whatever it is, read or paint or go for a walk or whatever. Uh, it's really important. Uh, and a lot of people don't get that. Mm -hmm. They just don't understand it. Yeah. And they go along because they're afraid they're going to get abandoned if they put up too much of a fuss. So they go along with it. And that's how all the resentments build up, all the frustrations and resentments. Mm -hmm. And then there's a big row. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then it calms down and it's all right for a little while. And then the whole thing starts all over again. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm seeing some things come to mind around there being three ent entities, three entities in a relationship. There's me, there's you, and there's us. And for, for people who are in this dance of um, codependency, there isn't a me and a you. It's just, it's just the us. Yeah. Yeah. It's all or nothing. Mm. So nice little uh, comment from Mirilda here. I heard someone say she's like a second pair of knickers. We are so close. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's a nice one, Meryl. Thank you. My Thank granny you. used to say, you know, they're like Darby and Joan. She used to say, they always do everything together. They're like Darby and Joan. And she admired that. She really, I mean, a woman who had, I think, was married three times or whatever. You know, she admired that. She thought that was wonderful. But, you know, I used to think, hmm, I wonder, is one mm. giving in? and just doing what the other one, you know, or is one just holding back and doesn't dare say anything, contradict or not agree with what their partner is saying. And I think there are a lot of, especially in perhaps older generation, mm -hmm. uh, I think there are a lot of people like that who, oh, you know, you see the husband, the, the long suffering husband that just, mm, he just sits there and he doesn't say anything, you know, and uh, it's not worth it because he's afraid if he if he says anything, he'll open a hornet's nest and then it'll be all hell to pay. So he'd rather have a quiet life. And my granny used to say, you know, um, it's just better sometimes to let sleeping dogs lie. Oh, my God, I heard this so many times. Or just to sweep it under the carpet. It could go away. Of course, it doesn't go away. <laughs> No, it just it just turns into a great big dusty pile of resentment. Oh, my God, it's just horrible. So um, anyway, um, so um, no questions. So just uh, just to clarify, was that all Pia Melody's book, Facing Love Addiction? Yes, it's this, yeah. okay. it's this one. Yeah, okay. This one. Yeah, Pia Melody. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She's great. She's really great. I can tell um, you're a big fan. Well, I love her work. I really do. Um, but I am going to... Um, ah, I found the bit on... I'm all over the place here. I've got the notes, but I don't know. I'm all over the place. But I have got the... This is from Face and Codependence. And the book won't like, look like this anymore because this is an old copy. But um, I think this is quite interesting because here uh, she talks about... Um, she talks about resentment and negative control. So um, in my opinion, the need to get revenge or punish comes from the, the belief that if I can sufficiently punish the person, I can keep this painful experiencing from ever happening to me again. This immature thinking developed in my childhood when I was unable to protect myself. So, where are we? God, the time's going. Um, and further, further, oh, so a bit more. When, hang on, what have I missed too? All right, okay. Forgiving a person who has hurt me means that I give up the need for revenge or punishment so that I can feel good inside myself. It doesn't mean that I must keep the person in my life constantly battling to protect myself and being hurt in the process. It doesn't mean I approve the person's actions. It just means I simply acknowledge my feelings, stop replaying the event in my mind, and give up the idea of revenge or punishment. So she goes on to talk about impaired boundaries. With no boundaries, I may often be offended because I am powerless to stop it. Whenever I believe that my boundaries have been transgressed, I experience anger, fear, and pain. At these times, resentment may enter in a need to get even. I am exposed to opportunities for resentment to occur in me more often than I would be if I had functional boundaries and could protect myself from being offended. And then she says, when I can't own my own thinking about myself, I use the opinion I think others have of me to define myself to me. So in other words, I will always listen to somebody else's opinion before I can put my own opinion first. And if I'm very fearful, 
then I will go with what other people think. And I think of my poor mother, and she did that the whole of her life. She always got the opinion of the family. She could never own her own truth and say what she really wanted. And the result was that, that you know, all the things that happened to her in her life, she depended on the family to make those, to make those decisions for her. So she remained a child, basically, throughout the whole of her life. So, um, now, let's go on, move on a little bit further, because time is ticking. Let's finish with that. Um, I've done that. So, um, Robert, Dr. Robert Lefebvre, uh, has days, a day and residential centres in London uh, named PROMIS, P-R-O-M-I-S, PROMIS Recovery Centres, dealing with all forms of addictive or compulsive behaviour. And um, do I have time to cover a few of the PROMIS lectures? Notes. I uh, don't I'm, really. I'm happy for you to go as long as. Well, you want I've, I've also. I also want to cover a bit of. Um, well. Well, I'll just read. I'll just read this very quickly. Uh, a primary relationship. This is from his Bible, A New Life, which I got hold of because I was. Uh, I was actually. Um, uh, allowed to sit in on some of the supervision groups at, at Promise. Uh, a primary relationship addict who uses other people as if they were drugs should be differentiated from a compulsive helper who uses himself or herself as a drug for other people. The addict and the compulsive helper may have a fatal attractive attraction for one another. Um, being locked into each other's addictive behavior in a dreadful dance. Furthermore, if one particular relationship breaks up, either partner will soon find a replacement with the same or comparable addictive tendencies as the last. And then he says, when two primary addicts, not compulsive helpers, are in a relationship together, the early stages of recovery of one can be exceedingly difficult, if not synchronized with the other. The pull of addictive disease is always stronger than the pull of recovery, so the risk of relapse is considerable. For this reason, the addict who is newly recovering, newly recovering needs considerable support in the anonymous fellowship and needs to be aware of the significant risks of trying to do what he or she often most wants to do to get some special person into recovery. At this time, in addition to attending his or her primary fellowship, it would be sensible to attend Helpers Anonymous or an equivalent family fellowship. And he says it is dangerous to make new relationships relationships in early recovery, the first year or even two, because each addict tends to be attracted to others at his or her own level of recovery. Thus, when addicts walk out of the treatment, out of treatment, they often do so in pairs, being attracted both physically and mentally to the bizarre wreckage in each other. New relationships are almost bound to falter when one partner grows ahead of the other in terms of recovery and spiritual health. The disease becomes progressively less attractive. Yet again, it is more probable that the disease will have the stronger pull and will undermine the recovery of the other. And I'll just tell you something that happened in group at Promise. Uh, Robert had been informed that two young people, they were both about 18, a young boy and a young girl, um, had uh, started having sex. And it's not allowed while you're in recovery in, in a rehab, in a residential setting, uh, that um, you have a relationship with somebody, you know, somebody in your group. And um, 
So, um, so what happened? Oh, yes. So the girl in question looked quite huffy because he brought it up in the group. Of course, he mentioned it. It's come to my knowledge, blah, blah, blah. The girl looked rather huffy, huffy and defiant. She didn't care. But the boy, however, looked quite remorseful. And uh, so Robert just looked at him and he said, um, so tell me, how does it feel to be used like a pill? So now I will briefly, briefly, uh, women who love too much. Robert briefly. Norwood. Yes. Robin Nord. Oh, Robin, no. sorry, not Robin. Robin, I'm sure she doesn't mind, Paul. Um, a, dysfun a dysfunctional family is one in which members play rigid roles and in which communication is severely restricted to statements that fit these roles. Members are not free to express a full range of experiences, wants, needs, and feelings, but rather must limit themselves to playing that part which accommodates those played by other family members. Roles operate in all families, but as circumstances change, the members must also change and adapt in order for the family to remain healthy. Thus, the kind of mothering appropriate for a one, for a one year old will be highly inappropriate for a 13 year old and the mothering role must alter to accommodate reality. In dysfunctional families, major aspects of reality are denied and roles remain rigid. When no one can discuss what affects every family member individually, as well as the family as a whole. Indeed, when such discussion is forbidden implicitly, the subject is changed or explicitly, oh, we don't talk about those things. We learn not to believe in our own perception or feelings. Because our family denies our reality, we begin to deny it too. And this severely impairs the development of our basic tools for living life and for relating to people and situations. It is this basic impairment that operates in women who love too much. We become unable to discern when someone or something is not good for us. The situation and people that others would naturally avoid as dangerous, uncomfortable or unwholesome do not repel us because we have no way of evaluating them realistically or self-protectively. We do not trust our feelings or use them to guide us. Instead, we are actually drawn to the very dangers, intrigues, dramas, and challenges that others with healthier and more balanced backgrounds would naturally issue. And through this attraction, we are further damaged because much of what we are attracted to is a replication of what we lived with growth what we lived with growing up we get hurt all over again no one becomes such a woman a woman who loves too much by accident to grow up as a female in this society in such a family can generate some predictable patterns so um i'm just going to tell you of a of a regarding family roles um Once in a supervision session where one of my trainee therapists was talking about a client, a young boy, he was only about 20 years old, who had come into therapy and he had been addicted to alcohol. So he had started the process of going to AA meetings and he had stopped drinking. And uh, the supervisee uh, was very pleased with the... Um, you know, his progress was really pleased. And each week she brought him and told him, oh, he's done this now and he's done this. And now he's talking about that. It's really beautiful the way this boy was recovering. Uh, and then four weeks into recovery, he reported that his family was struggling with the change that was taking place in him. 
So they weren't able to change. And because he was no longer playing his role in the family uh, dynamic as being the needy, damaged child. Uh, and uh, he later relapsed and uh, started drinking again. That's how powerful a family dynamic is. Mm. And this is it's probably really, true of, of all forms of recovery, I would suggest, whether it's yeah. from a, a substance addiction or Whatever. a relationship addiction. Absolutely. You, Absolutely. you need that support around you, don't you? You need yeah. people to change and grow with you. But if the family isn't strong and they've got their own codependent needs uh, and, you know, the dynamic is made up, each person has a role within the family. And if that person exits and no longer fills that role, then they're like Skittles. They just fall. They fall. They can't cope. They fall mm. all over the place. Nothing works anymore. Mm. I'll just finish by the two diagrams that I sent you. Can you put them afterwards up? Because the um, the psychosocial journey of the self is really important. This 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 is from couples work. This is from Imago counseling and couples work, and it really shows very clearly at each stage of our de development what happens um and i'll just read ugh, from hendrix's book um what he says about the imago uh he called his his couples counseling therapy imago um relationship therapy and the reason he called it imago is this to guide you in your search for the ideal mate, someone who both resembled your caretakers and compensated for the repressed parts uh, of yourself, you relied on an unconscious image of the opposite sex that you'd been forming since birth. I have given this inner picture the name imago, which is a Latin term for image. Essentially, your imago is a composite picture of the people who influenced you most strongly at an early age. This may have been your mother and father, one or more siblings, or maybe a babysitter or close relative. But whoever they were, a part of your brain recorded everything about them. The sound of their voices, the amount of time they took to answer your cries, the color of their skin when they got angry, the way they smiled when they were happy, the set of their shoulders, the way they moved their bodies, their characteristic moods, their talents and interests. Along with these impressions, your brain recorded all your significant interactions with them. Your brain didn't interpret these data, it simply etched them onto a template. It may seem improbable that you have such a detailed record of your caretakers somewhere inside your head when you have only a dim recollection of those early years. In fact, many people have a hard time remembering anything that happened to them before the age of five or six. Even dramatic events that should have made a deep impression, but scientists report that we have incredible amounts of hidden information in our brains. Neurosurgeons discovered this fact while performing brain surgery on patients who were under local anesthetic. Uh, they stimulated portions of the patient's brains with weak electrical currents, and the patients were suddenly able to recall hundreds of forgotten episodes from childhood in astonishing detail. There are those who suggest that everything that we have ever experienced resides somewhere in the dark, convoluted recesses of our brain. And that's why EMDR therapy is so brilliant, because you stir it all up, but you also reprocess it. So there's no longer the emotions connected to the memories, and it's brilliant work. Mm. That's it, folks. Lovely. So uh, perhaps I will share. Can I share this thingy application? There we go. Share. Is that the the diagram? Yeah, that's it. it. Yeah. That's it. Uh, nice, nice little doodles. Will um, they be able to? Will anybody looking at this afterwards be able to see that? 
Or I, will, I will upload it to the thank hive you. after this talk so people okay, can have a look thank you. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to just say a little bit about this so it gives it a bit of context, Jackie? Uh, right. Well, so, um, you know, when you start off at the developmental stage, which is the attachment stage, and then um, the, you know, from birth, this is the, the this is our early experience of being in the world, and then uh, up until about fifteen months, the exploration period when a baby starts to explore its surroundings and get to know everything about where it is, and then um, and then further exploring that goes on from that, um, which is up to to. Uh, two and a half or three years old or whatever and then after that um well no at two years old i think he's got 30 to 48 months the the at 15 to 30 months our identity begins to form and then at 30 to 48 months the sense of personal power our competence starts to grow and then as you go up um, you know, that at 48 to 72 months, that's where empathy starts to build, to be born, mm -hmm. a concern for others. And then seven to 12 years, that intimacy, empathy, the ability to love, the, 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 the understanding of what it is to be intimate and loving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then 12 to 19 years, the integrated period of, of, of finding love and, and understanding love. And then, uh, you know, everyone's um, ability to uh, understand um, themselves and how they, how they operate in society. Mm -hmm. And then um, the rest is, is, 20 years on is life's experience that yeah. that um, everyone goes through great thank you so um the book somebody was asking for the book so we've got facing love addiction pia melody women who love too much by robin norwood getting the love you want a guide for couples by harville hendrix who's also the imago guy and then facing love addiction and facing codependence, of course. But, you know, I know everybody can't read. I mean, if I was to recommend one book, it would be facing love addiction. Mm -hmm. I, really, I think it's really important because she covers, she goes over all the codependence stuff again. Uh, it's constant because it's part of it. So um, that for me would be the one that uh, if I could only look at one, that's the one I'd be looking at. Great. Okay. Smashing. Ah, right. So, folks, let's see if we've got any questions before we end. There we are. Uh, thank you both for a very informative chat and a great chat to end on. Thank you, Jackie. Lovely. OK, so, folks, if you've got any other questions, you can fire them through quickly now or feel free to comment after the fact if, uh, if anything pops into your mind. And uh, perhaps Jackie will be good enough to answer those. Oh, I will. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank I'm happy. Yep. And Karen says, thank you, Jackie and Paul. The diagram is great. Wonderful. So, yeah, that was, um, I found that really interesting. So thank you for, again for all of your preparation and expertise and also the, the personal examples from your own experience, which always adds some mm. um, authenticity, some an extra level of um, that kind of uh, realness. Yeah. Mm. Real examples. So thank you. I just go back to the training. You know, our training, uh, because I, I, after I'd finished the, the five year training, I, I did the supervision training, as you know, and um, I was supervising quite a few groups. And um, in each group, we had uh, we had at least one person who was from another another college, so different orientation, not transpersonal. Uh, and um, it used to be interesting because the majority of the of the trainees in the groups were CCP trainees. 
And uh, in there, when they used to feed back and, and, and present their clients, they would be talking about planes of consciousness and archetypes and all kinds of stuff. And it was always interesting to watch the people who weren't CCPE trained, you know, their eyes are because they never heard of this stuff, you know. <laughs> and we, we used to explain, of course, and, and so that they, they understood a little bit, but, but what can you do? You know, you've got a, you've got a one hour supervision session and there's only so much you can explain. But that really hit it, hit the nail on the head for me when I realized, you know, I'd been very fortunate to do such a, an inclusive training, such a good training. Yeah, yeah, I can second that with my experience so far. Lovely. Okay, so anything else you want to bring before we end, Jackie? No. No. Nope. Okay, so that closes the inner child. Really interesting ah, stuff. Um, yes. Yeah, got some, lots of thanks coming in. And we will be seeing you again at the end of August and, and also in September. Mm -hmm. It's lovely, yeah. You're um, you you like my co-presenter now, Jackie. You're here so often. Hardly. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, thanks everybody. Thanks, Paul. See you soon. Take care of yourself. There we go, folks. So, thank you for your interactions. Hope you enjoyed that. Some nice, uh, nice comments coming in. Meryl is thirding the, the thumbs up for the training. So if anyone is considering becoming a psychotherapist and you're interested in the spiritual, integrative, experiential aspects, then there's only one place to go. Actually, there are, there are lots of places to go, but for me, there was only one place to go. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's it. And um, Friday tomorrow, so 10.30 tomorrow morning, Jaffa and Steve, Tools for Living Your Life, Book Club on Saturday, Sing a Size, 7 p.m. on Sunday. Go on. Give it a go. You know you want to. And uh, and then we've got Joanne coming in on Monday to talk about OCD. What is that really like? Um, so that'll be really interesting. Joanne's had 20 years of living with OCD and supporting clients also with uh, meeting their goals and living a good life despite their diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder. And then I'm going on holiday, uh, which I'm looking forward to. So um that's it. Thanks again, folks, and hopefully see you soon. Take care.